Welcome to the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City. In this series, Karen Armstrong, Oliver Sacks, Mike Nichols, Bill Viola, Ken Burns, Philip Glass, Sandra Bernhardt, Michael Cunningham, Robert Wilson, and Laurie Anderson have come to the museum to talk about nothing to celebrate the exhibition Grain of Emptiness. In this session, director Peter Sellers meets with activist Raj Patel to discuss the economics of nothing. Partially one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation tonight, to end the Nothing series, but to move Nothing into a really positive and urgent place, uh, because that's where we find ourselves at the moment. The urgency is clear. How the urgency becomes positive is the question and the demand. And that book is one of the most positive and powerful books written about collapse. Would you talk a little bit about you know, what that book feels like a couple of years later in what's surrounding us? Um, sure. I, I guess the, the Thanks, Peter. <laughs> uh, step two, by the way, is to get tickets to see this, which is going to be amazing. Um, but um, yeah, well, I, mean, the, 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 I mean, the title, The Value of Nothing, isn't, obviously isn't mine, it, 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 it's, it, it's from the Oscar Wilde uh, line that nowadays people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Um, and <laughs> two years after writing that book, it seems that, uh, I mean, that th th while, while our economy is recovering, things don't seem to be awfully uh, better. Um, again, one of the oldest you know, sort of misvaluations comes from the lack of value for unpaid work, the, the kind of work that builds communities, that sustains communities, that keeps communities going, particularly when there's no money coming in, whether that's you know, volunteer work, whether that's the, the care work of looking after children or looking after elders. Uh, and most of that work is done by women around the world. Um, and just to give you a sense, I mean, th the last time someone ran the numbers was in 1995. Uh, and the, the value then of the global economy was trying to get around $30 trillion. And about half of that was unpaid women's work. Um, unpaid, and again, that's because women's, you know, women's work, this kind of, of, of what academics called reproductive labor, the, 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 the labor of, of bringing up communities, of sustaining communities, of building communities, that's valued at, bing. There we go. <laughs> So, so, and and I think now, I mean, I mean, these are these are old, uh, you know, these are old failures of valuation within the economy, um, but they're they're more acute now. I mean, if you look at the number of you know the number of hungry people in the United States, that number has gone up over the past two years. We're now at we're only 50 million Americans are in a position of food insecurity. A majority of them are women, um, and you know we're also living through the advanced sort of impacts of climate change uh, and. You know, I don't need to tell anyone in, in New York that, that there seems to be a little more precipitation than there used to be. One of the ways in which we're told, look, we can make the world better. All we have to do is shop smarter. You know, well, we, as long as we go out and buy, you know, something that says shade grown and uh, <laughs> organic, you know, uh, grass fed uh, and, and, you know, dolphin friendly, tuna friendly, you know, sort of locust Compatible, um, and, and and then you know, and, and we feel like you know, that that that's going to be great. You know, and, and again, I have no moral high ground. I am a self-hating Prius driver, um, but, but I I think that, that there there is this sort of idea that that we are ultimately we sort of we feel like we're just one person, and if you're just one person, what can you do? And I mean, I, I'm hands up, who's ever felt that? I'm just one person. What can I do? Okay, well, that, that, that sense of just one person, what can I do, is again a symptom of capitalism, uh, and a, a symptom of the way in which we, you know, the, the world in which we find ourselves, where we are atomized and individuated. And so when people ask, as they do, well, I'm just one person, what can I do? Um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's all right to say, well, you're not just a, you know, a consumer, you are a citizen. But you're not just an individual citizen. You're, we're, we're part of a, a broader group. We're, 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 we, we, there's more to us than just the us. And of course, this is, you know, this is a very Buddhist idea this, um, about how ultimately trivial the self is and yet how it's sort of connected with others around us 
uh, th that self becomes. And that's the question I want to ask you about, because one of the moments that we find ourselves in here is a moment <laughs> of being part of an audience and being part of a, uh, being part of a group. And I, I want to ask you about the audience. I, I mean, not just you, but, but the audience and everything that you do, because I'm, I'm interested in how you can break down the, the, what you do with the self in the things, that, in, in, in your productions. Okay, I'm gonna come back to him, because this, this, uh, this audience thing, I mean, this is one of the activists in the world I most admire, and I wanna deal with your audience and how you move with that. Just to say a couple of things to answer a little bit of what Please. you're asking. All Please. right, all right, all right. Uh, basically, um, in my line of work, the value of nothing is very great. That is to say, Picasso or Georgia O'Keeffe start the day with a blank sheet of paper. And that is incredibly powerful. And at the end of the day, it's not blank anymore. And what our job is as artists is to recognize what is not here yet, is to see the empty spaces where something is waiting to appear and has not yet appeared. And so with my students, a lot of my, a lot of my work of suggesting to students how they find themselves as artists and as activists is what is missing from this picture? Look around you, see what is not here yet, and devote your life to it. Because you're here to actually put something where there is nothing. And to engage with what's missing, with absence. And to find some way in which that absence becomes presence. And so, the absence is the open space, the space you have to move. Because one of the reasons I didn't want to live in New York when I was young was just that I thought the air had been breathed here too many times. <laughs> and, and I had to hear what you know, everyone had done already, which was irritating. And there was no space for me to do anything. And we all need space to do what we're here to do. And so for me, one of the key things as an artist is looking and finding the space. Because everyone says, oh, there's no room here. And of course, there's room everywhere. And so, strangely, for a generation of theater makers who saw a lot of my early work, exactly where they were looking for something, there was nothing. Ding. They were, <laughs> they were looking for what a professional would do is give a clue to the audience how to react. And those were the signals that were missing from my work. I actually had eliminated those signals on purpose not because I didn't want people to react, but I wanted people's reactions to arrive, uh, if I could use the word after your opening tirade, organically, uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and not be coerced from outside, hmm. and create something where gradually the emotion in the room becomes not my product, but the product of the audience. The temperature in the room is set by the audience, not by the stage. And gradually, we're arriving at a temperature that's not been dictated or predetermined, but is the place this group of people is able to go on this particular evening, and where we're all carrying each other to a place we didn't and haven't been to before. We didn't know we could create or sustain, and we have never visited before. And for me, the power of theater is that hope every night that will go to a place we didn't know how to get to. I, I mean, the, the, in, in a sense, that this, this gets back to a, a sort of ambiguity where, the, in, in something you were saying about seeing things happen and seeing, uh, being able to learn through seeing. Now, it, in some ways, of course, that, that's very true. In other ways, we have been reduced to, to very passive spectators when it comes to social change, for example, where we are relying on great leaders to do it for us. And we, you know, and we can watch them at home, <laughs> and that'd be fine. In fact, they like you to be, you know, just sort of you know, changing the channels. And, you know, here is leadership. Hands are being shaken. Backs are being slapped. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, change will be wrought. And just, you know, mean, meantime, you know, here's a commercial for something that you need to buy. Um, and, and yet, you know, the, the, the idea of leadership proliferating despite leaders. You know, this is a very anarchist idea. Of, no gods, no gods nor, nor masters. I mean, I, I love that idea. Um, oh my God. Oh my God.
And, and I think that that's what we're seeing in Egypt. We're certainly seeing it in Algeria. We're seeing it in Tunisia. But we're see, you know, we, we, that, again, has a much, much longer history. Talk about the spark. Talk about what it meant when the man lit himself on fire. What, I mean, here we are in uh, a museum devoted to a uh, culture where there are images of people burning, burning as a level of entering a state of consciousness, where it w was dedicated, dedicated Vietnamese Buddhists who set themselves on fire to protest the Vietnam War. And that gesture reaches beyond the usual political uh, rhetoric and moves to a place where a human being becomes a living torch, becomes a gesture of light, becomes a gesture of heat, becomes a gesture of transformation, and, and awakens something that, of course, has been there every day in millions of people. But that one spark suddenly releases a flood. Mm. And again, it's, it's never just one spark. It's always about the kindling. It's always about the, the, the context. Because, I mean, you know, the, 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 the horror is that immolations happen every day, that protests of right, these of kinds of course, of course. Right, yes. are, I mean, and particularly, yes. I mean, what, what, what one in thinks of India, the, the, yeah. in India, for example. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, you know, and it, 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 and even the, 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 the protests in Vietnam n was about a certain kind of spectacle and a certain kind of audiences, mm -hmm. uh, a certain kind of relation and a certain kind of m moment in the United States um, that then resulted in, uh, in transformation happening. But I, I think, and, and the, the one word here that, that, that's, that's always very dangerous, mm -hmm. always, what one ought to be suspicious of is the idea of spontaneity, um, where, I mean, when one sees, you know, when, 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 when journalists report, you know, that, that, that something happened and then there were spontaneous protests and people, you know, spontaneously took to the streets, that's, that's hard for me to imagine because I mean, as an organizer, spontaneous protests take forever to organize. <laughs> I mean, to, to be able to have the, I mean, to, to be able to have in circulation the idea that actually, you know, we are more powerful than this, that, that we, we don't have to simply watch in horror, but we can do something about that. It takes work. You know, because one of the problems is we're not, none of us are actually meeting each other. We're all hearing about what the other person thinks, which is in lieu of a conversation. You know, and what we actually need to do is be meeting each other, and we need to be in the same space, and we need to be sharing that space, and in the process, something will happen. I mean, my, my, my usual image of that is, um, is really, really basic. It's just, you know, at, you're at a dinner party, and you're about to say the stupidest thing in the world. And amazingly, you know, Buddha manifests that the person opposite you, right over their head, and they say something unbelievably brilliant that reduces everything you were about to say to ash. And you do this miraculous thing. You shut up for the next six minutes. <laughs> and you think of something else to say. And eventually, you rejoin the conversation with something much smarter. Now, if someone had taken a poll at the beginning of the dinner, they would have got your stupid point because your stupid point had not yet been engaged in a larger conversation. And so your best idea wasn't that good. And your best idea got better when it was exposed to a wider range of ideas and possibilities that liberated you from the corner you had painted yourself into <laughs> and invited you to move to your next best place. And for me, that's the whole point of democracy, is that none of us stay where we are once you actually engage. And to me, what I'm missing, and why I think theater will never go out of fashion, no matter how much internet there is, is nothing will substitute for people sharing an actual space together. And what this time is, when people are trying to build walls between the US and Mexico, or Israel and Palestine, in fact, the project for the 21st century is shared space. And that dynamic, of course, is why the arts were created, is to create the space that is, by definition, dynamic, when political life is frequently quite static or economic life is quite static. You need a zone that is charged with being dynamic, permanently. And so the arts 
are that, that space uh, to, to insist on movement. So that they're, and to insist on challenge, and to insist on face-to-face -face meeting. That we're really in the same space. And when you're in the same space as your enemies, something happens. It's very powerful. It's very powerful. Or you're in the space with a person who you just can't stand. And you know, I know everybody in this room has had that experience where you just are so upset having to go into the room you're about to go into with a person you totally don't want to see. And the strange thing is two hours later, it was very important you saw that person. And if you had your choice, you would not have gone into that room. And it turns out your life would have been poorer. But you were all set to cancel that appointment. And for me, it's, it's a lot of creating the, the possibility that you're finally in the room with everything you've avoided being in the room with and everyone you've avoided being in the room with. And again, we find weirdly that you turn out to share a lot of the things with the person you were most self not identifying with. And then yourself, what you think of as yourself moves. And that's very powerful. And that's why this political organizing, you know, everybody in the same room, finding unexpected reservoirs of dignity together is really where we need to go.